we all have experienced what we jokingly refer to as a senior moment. However, what if such memory difficulties are diagnosed as Alzheimer's disease? What happens to our quality of life and how can it be improved? What methods of communication will promote feelings of calm and safety? In what manner should we react if a person living with Alzheimer's easily becomes agitated and exhibits personality and behavior changes? Hello, my name is Attorney Ramsey Barawi, and welcome to Your Money, Your Life. Today, my guest is Lori LeBay. Ms. LeBay is the founder and CEO of Alzheimer's Speaks, a U.S.-based advocacy group that provides education and supports for those living with Alzheimer's disease. A passionate dementia care advocate, Ms. LeBay was recognized by ShareCare and Dr. Oz as the number one online influencer for Alzheimer's disease. As host of Alzheimer's Speaks Radio and the webinar series Dementia Chats, Lori connects people to best practices and facilitates conversations regarding the need for dementia care worldwide. She also shares her insights by addressing large and small groups in a fun, enlightening, and calming manner. And if that isn't enough, Lori has been a contributing author to four books. She's currently working on a fifth, which will detail her 30-plus year journey with her mother's memory loss. Lori, welcome to Your Money, Your Life. It's great to have you on the program. Well, I'm thrilled to be here. Thanks for having me, Ramsey. You underwent a career change. And could you explain to our viewers why you started Alzheimer's Speaks? Well, the reason I started it was I've been on this journey with my mom for 30 years with memory loss. And, you know, there comes a point in time where you just have to decide what do you want to do with your life? And at pushing 50, I just decided, you know, there's a story that needs to be told. I was really tired of the lack of services, even though there's there's a lot out there that organizations offer us, what I what I found was a lot of it was, you know, they wanted our money. They wanted they wanted funds. And what I was looking for was how to live with the disease. Someone to teach me, you know, how best to work with this um, with this disease. And uh, it just it needed to be done in a different fashion. And so I started Alzheimer Speaks uh, to try to remove the fears and give hope to people. Now, when it comes to Alzheimer's and caregiving, uh, do you have specific thoughts about uh, how a caregiver should be behaving and caring for somebody living with Alzheimer's? Could you share that perspective? Um, I sure can. You know, with Alzheimer's or, or when caregiving in general, um, I have a very different perception of what caregiving is. Most people think caregiving is this crisis state and um, they're overwhelmed. Uh, and one of the things that I try to do is to get people to change their perspective, to realize that we're caregivers from the moment we're conceived. So, you know, my biggest thing that I think people have to look at caregiving is that it's a natural state and it's not something that we should be frightened of. Um, but we just need to always, um, as we pick up different roles, as our life progresses, we need new tools. Um, but the basic skill factor is still there. It's about compassion. It's about listening and looking for the needs of others and how to make them feel you know, happy, safe, and pain-free. Um, and again, as, as we grow up, and as we go through life, um, the types of support that we're gonna need for the various phases in our life is gonna change. And so we just have to search those out. Dementia being one, cancer being another, getting married, getting divorced, those are all different roles we're taking on. It might be a young kid who's um, learning to drive or going on a first date, <laughs> you know. Um, there's all different types of support systems we need, but it's still a basic um, skill set of compassion and caring. You know, in, in my opening, Laurie, I said that people, people will oftentimes joke about having a senior moment. Uh, dementia, however, is no joke. Uh, could you share with us a story to help our audience understand how people are affected by Alzheimer's disease and other types of dementias? 
I would love to. I have a story called Betty the Bald Chicken. This is a, a very, I think, poignant story that really makes us think about who are we when we care and how we care. And the story goes like this. There's a chicken by the name of Betty, and she lives on a farm. And one day she's out in the barnyard with everyone else, and she's nibbling on corn, and she's eating away. And all of a sudden she feels this tug and this pull. And she looks around, but she doesn't see anybody standing right by her because everybody's eating independently. She doesn't know what happened. And she decides she's not going to say anything to anybody because what would she tell them? There was nothing, nothing to say other than she has kind of this ominous feeling that something isn't quite right. So she puts her head back down to, to nibble away at her corn. And as she does, she sees that there's one lone feather that has fallen from her. And she doesn't know how and she doesn't know why, but she just has this daunting feeling that life's never going to be the same and she continues on with her life and she doesn't mention anything to friends or family until about three months later when she's out in the barnyard once again um, eating supper except this time when she feels the tug and the pull it was so forceful she squawks out really loud and when she does all the other animals in the barnyard turn and look at her and it's at this point they see a handful of feathers on the ground they see Betty is bloody and pockmarked they realize for the first time she has lost an awful lot of feathers and they start pulling their kids back and they start pushing her away and over time um, she's just not welcomed in her community with her family or her friends. She really is ostracized. People don't invite her to parties and gatherings. Uh, they rarely talk to her. So one day Betty decides she's going to go wander the outskirts of the farm because she just doesn't feel like she fits in anymore. And she's feeling so sad and so alone and so isolated. And as she's wandering the outskirts, she trips over this big rock and she falls into this ravine. And as she falls down the ravine, she's screaming and she's just feeling so hopeless. And she's thinking, is this how my life is going to end? I'm going to get squashed at the bottom of a ravine. And no one's ever going to find me. But what Betty didn't know was at the bottom of the ravine was another community and they were called the Caring Corral and they all heard Betty's screams and so they came running to help to cradle her and break her fall. And they welcomed her into their new community and um, made her healthy again. And over time, Betty decided not to leave that community because there she was accepted. People got along with her, they talked to her, they invited her, they included her where up in the farm, she was isolated and she was alone. And so over the years, Betty had a great life down in the ravine. And then one day she turned ill and ended up in the hospital. And it was at this point, all the animals down in the ravine and the caring corral got together and decided to send Mr. Horse up to the barnyard to inform all the other animals that Betty wasn't doing well. And um, as he told all the animals, he asked them, you know, would you like to come visit Betty? We're not sure she's going to make it. So the question that I pose to everybody is, who are you? Are you Betty? Have you been isolated by friends and family because they're uncomfortable with the disease that you might have? Are you somebody who lived in the farm, who's pushed away a, a family member or a friend or a coworker because you yourself have been afraid and not sure how to deal with it? Or are you someone who lives in the caring corral, who scoops somebody up, who is so desperately in need of unconditional love and acceptance and purpose in their life? You can see, we don't ask these questions very often, but it's a critical, critical point because people with dementia feel so desperately isolated and the fear is so, so spooky to them. 
um, they really, really need our support. And so it's important for us to, to know and realize how we are acting and how we are reacting to people, not just what we say, but how we, how we uh, talk through all our nonverbal communication. That's a really great story, and, and I like how you used uh, the chicken as an analogy for somebody with Alzheimer's disease or a dementia of some sort. What stood out for me in that story is the fact that uh, the people around the chicken obviously became fearful of the chicken as the chicken was screaming, as you put it, and was obviously there was something wrong with the chicken. Bringing that to families, why do family members have such a difficult time accepting dementia in one of their loved ones? I mean, why do they? Why are they so fearful? And as you put it, isolate somebody. Why? Well, um, basically, we are a, a society that pushes things by fear. That's how we raise money. You know, fear fear scares people to doing things, and I personally think that that needs to change. Um, you know, there's enough fear on the table with any type of illness. People don't need any more. What they need is help and support and hope. And I believe that if we give them help, support, and hope, they will, you know, um, give money for research. They will donate to, to businesses who are providing care. They will volunteer their time. But it's a real um, re-engineering of societal standards and what's, what's acceptable. How do we advertise? You know, um, and that's, that's a big nut to crack. <laughs> that's a really big nut sure. to crack. Sure. Um, but it's time to change. It, it's just, it's too devastating to way, way too many people. We have to realize also that families a lot of times are in denial. You know, it's not something that they want to accept is happening to a loved one or a friend. Um, and, and that's a normal part of the grieving process. Um, but we also have to help people through the process and we don't want them to get stuck. Um, where it's going to be detrimental to them and to those that they care for. Now, you mentioned that family members uh, may be in denial. Uh, do you know of any situations where the individual living with Alzheimer's is in denial and is reluctant to accept his or her illness? Oh, that's very common. Very, very common. And it's a kind of a normal um, part of the disease. Um, and what's interesting, what I find when I talk with so many of the folks with early onset is they'll be very open about uh, telling people about their situations and how it's different. And they'll and then their friends and their family will say, oh, I've had a senior moment. I've forgotten my keys. We all do it. And, and they're very much, they feel belittled and they feel non-validated. And so then they start questioning themselves, is this a problem or isn't this a problem? And I think some of the, the, the escalated denial um, comes into gear as the disease starts progressing more, as it becomes scarier. Because when you are trying to talk to people and trying to find support, and they're not willing to talk to you, what's gonna happen when it really gets bad? It's a very difficult time for the family uh, when the family decides that they're ready to accept it and now the person who's having issues is not willing to accept it. And there really isn't a whole lot you can do with that. Um, again, it's a processing thing. And one of the things people will tell you over and over and over again is you can't argue with a person with dementia because it's not a, not necessarily a rational thought process like you and I have. Um, even though they use the same equation, uh, they're just coming from a little bit different angle. And so sometimes it's just a matter of giving them comfort and support, allowing them to be as independent as possible and realizing that it doesn't, everything doesn't have to be perfect. If you're having a conversation with somebody who has dementia and, and you end up in, in a, let's say a debate, um, how, how do you communicate with that person if they are, to quote you, coming from a different angle, if they're not necessarily being as rational as, as, you, as they used to be, as you knew them to be? Uh, how should you communicate with them? What should you do? What shouldn't you do? 
Well, with something like that, sometimes it's good to do diversions and try to switch topics because typically you're not going to win. Um, and so, you know, you're not going to convince them it's differently. A lot of families and friends get into this argument mode of right or wrong. No, you're not going to the doctor today. You're going on Wednesday. Well, does it really matter? You know, um, or the story didn't go like that. It happened like this. Is it critical? It really, most of this stuff isn't because they're not going to the doctor till you take them to the doctor, you know, and, and they'll typically forget after a period of time. And so we find ourselves arguing over points that really don't matter. So, um, you know, one of the things that, that I have found um, to help with that process is, is what I, is a simple tool that I call your memory chip. And your memory chip asks three simple questions, and this can be uh, downloaded from your site or off my website as well. Um, the first is, what do I want the person to know? And one of the things that we should realize when we're dealing with somebody with dementia is, you know, what do we want them to know? And for a family member, typically it's that I love you. And so it's important to set up a routine on how you approach the person. What's your tone of voice? What side are you going to approach them with? Are you going to give them a kiss when you enter? Um, but set up a routine. Routines are critical, and they help um, kind of in embed in our memory um, these routines. The, the second question is probably the most critical. When I would typically ask caregivers, what do you need to focus on? They would all rattle off a list of things they had to do. I have to make the meals. I got to get them to the doctor. I have to communicate with the family. I have to do the laundry. I have to, I have to, I have to. And there's just this big long list. And the whole list was about the person they were caring for. And so we would consider that person-centered. It's all about them. I just gave you the list. But what I found with every single person that I interviewed over multiple years was that they all had a twang in their voice. Every item they stated emotionally they didn't really want to be doing. And I could hear that in the tone of their voice or a roll of the eyes or some other nonverbal. And so we can't be person-centered if we are emotionally focused on ourselves. And so, and I was one of them. I did the same thing. And what I found was when I could focus on three simple things, not the task, but if I really wanted to be person-centered, I had to focus on, um, you know, for me and my mom, was she safe, was she happy, and was she pain-free? And when I focused on those three things, then I now no longer um, had to do a task in a certain way because her comfort and care took priority. And I was much more engaged with her. And I found that doing the task was um, less of a burden um, and more fun. It gave us time to be mother and daughter. And that's something that a lot of people lose is their relationship when, when giving care. And then the third um, piece on your memory chip asks, what, what do you always want to remember about this person? Because I also found that there was great fear that family and friends have that they're not going to remember the person who, who was. So capture those moments. You know, make note of pictures, um, videotape, audio record. You know, we've got all these portable cell phones that do wonderful things. Write a story, write a poem, um, write down your favorite recipe, your favorite story. It doesn't make any difference, but just capture it so you don't have to waste time worrying about losing it. And all of those things that you capture, you're able to relive with this person with dementia and you're able to share those with other family members and friends if you choose. And I learned so many things about both of my parents. My dad had um, brain cancer, my mom with dementia, by friends of their sharing stories I never would have heard as a child. And then I was able to relive them with them. So instead of spinning on something that I can't control or I'm trying to correct because I want it to be perfect, I started to learn to 
go with the flow and to live in the moment and look for the joy. And so my goal was really creating the joy, finding the joy. And we're not going to find what we don't look for. What you've said basically is that people make mistakes when they're dealing with a person living with Alzheimer's. And um, some of the mistakes are that they go and they correct somebody. And as you said, it really doesn't matter why correct them. Uh, they criticize them. Why be critical? As you said, they're going to forget. Uh, they try to control a situation. Why control it? It's really not within your control anymore. Um, and you know everything you said makes perfect sense. But people have a tendency to make these mistakes, and I hope our viewers recognize that and hopefully are able to change their behavior and able to focus on those memory chips that you mentioned because I think that's that's critical. It changes your your perspective completely when you're able to focus uh, on those memory chips. Uh, and and those are tools, as you as you mentioned them, uh, that help uh, family members to interact with loved ones who have memory loss. I want to ask a, a, a different type of a question. It's similar, actually, to what we've talked about, but still different. And that is, how can a family member promote a feeling of comfort and safety in a person living with Alzheimer's, especially if that person is um, not living with a family member, maybe living still at home alone, or maybe living in an assisted living facility? You know, how, how do you do that? It can be, uh, you know, a little difficult. I mean, there's no ifs, ands, or buts. There can be a lot of resentment. Um, a, a lot of times if somebody's um, been placed, um, there's anger that they've been moved. And a lot of times family will say, I'm never going to place you. You know, I'm going to keep you home. And when we make those promises, things are different. They're, they're controllable. And then there comes a point in time where it's not safe. Uh, for the for the person with dementia and it's not safe necessarily for the caregiver and we need to make sure that both are living healthy lives and so many times our caregivers get so exhausted they get sick and that's you know that's the last thing they want to happen and so for families, um, I, you know, I think, you know, what helped me the most was really letting go of the control and letting people have their emotions, which, you know, we're a society where we're all supposed to fit in the box. And when I came to the realization that emotions really aren't good or bad, it's our reactions to them that can get us in trouble but they are a normal part of the pie. And you can't feel happy without feeling sad. You know, there's the yin and the yang of it. And if you can keep that into perspective, that can make a huge, huge difference. There's a, an exercise that I do with people that's real interesting. And I'll just have two people stand palm to palm with one another. And I'll have one push and pretend like there's a line between their feet and they'll be standing up and one will try to push over the line and the other one is going to try to push back and kind of in this tug of war stance and when people do that they kind of get into this sumo wrestler mode then i have them switch it up and i have one person push and then i have the other person just have their hands go all over and lead them around so the other person is pushing and now all of a sudden they're dancing the whole demeanor of the room changes and um, how I explain this to people is that sometimes we just need to vent. We don't need answers, but we need to know that somebody is there with us, willing to listen, and will still love us, even though we, we have these really strong feelings. But people have to be able to let them out. And again, you don't want to get... Um, you don't want to get in a physically violent situation that's going to call for a whole a whole nother level and medications might become in order but it may be triggered by environment too so we have to we have to first key the environment we have to check ourselves and try to figure out what the triggers are because there are always triggers to every behavior um, and if we can remember that a person with dementia uses the same equation as, as anyone else to react, and that equation is really simple. It's our current attitude plus our past experiences equal our perceptions, and our perceptions trigger our reactions. 
Now, somebody with dementia might be digging into a different pool than what they used to, but there is always a rational reason if we can follow if we can follow the evidence and the triggers, if we can kind of put on that investigative hat. It's incredible what we can find and what we can change um, when they can't communicate the way they used to, um, to delete some of the um, some of the behaviors that they're exhibiting, some of the, the anger or the sadness. There's usually a reason for that. Laurie, if our viewers want to communicate with you, how can you best be reached? Um, through my website, which is just www.alzheimerspeaks.com, and that's A-L-Z-H-E-I-M-E-R-S, and then speaks, S-P-E-A-K-S, dot com. So there's two S's in the middle, and then speaks is plural as well. Laurie, that's a great place for us to stop. Alzheimer's disease is the most common form of dementia. It's a progressive disease that slowly destroys a person's memory, judgment, and functionality. Just like the rest of our bodies, as we age, our brains change. Although we notice some occasional change, related slow thinking and memory loss, serious memory loss, confusion, language difficulties, and other major changes may be a sign of a more serious problem. My guest, Lori LeBay, shared with us that effective communication with a person living with Alzheimer's requires patience, understanding, and good listening skills. Decreasing the stress of both the caregiver and the person living with Alzheimer's is crucial. Don't convey annoyance. Avoid criticizing or correcting. Be patient. Adjusting your behavior in these ways will likely establish a positive pattern of communication leading to a reduction of stress, anger, and conflict. In other words, communicate in a positive, constructive, and effective way. By connecting in this way, you may find that your loved one feels more loved, important, and understood. To better understand Alzheimer's disease, educate yourself. A good place to start is Lori LeBay's website at www.alzheimerspeaks.com. Also listen to her Alzheimer's Speaks radio program. In closing, thanks to my guest, Lori LeBay, for her participation on this program. Lori, thank you. Thank you, it was a pleasure being with you today. I really appreciate you having me on the show. And as always, thank you to you, our viewers, for watching Your Money, Your Life. My name is attorney Ramsey Barawi, building your trust. Thank you.